just on the shores of the heavenly lake outside of Rumki in western China. Traditional gur over my shoulder, blue sky and sun beating down with a little bit of snow on the ground and a cup of green tea. Hard to beat. We're at the east gate of Jiaohou, which was an ancient city in China. In fact, founded in around about the 4th to 6th century BC, lasting until 1275, and was for a period of time a capital of one of the 36 kingdoms of China. It's protected as a World Heritage Site because they say it's one of the finest examples of a mud brick built city in the world and the only one that had no city walls. The reason it had no city walls is because it's protected by 30 metre or higher cliffs around the entire circumference of the city. It sits on an island between a couple of rivers and it lasted for around about 1600 years until the Mongols came in and sacked the place. In between the time, it was one of the vital stops along the Great Silk Road. If you were coming from the west, you'd cross the border into China, and this would be one of the first cities you'd see before you headed to Kashgar or Xi'an. And if you were Chinese going the other way, this was the last one of the homeland cities you'd see before you'd hit the wild steeps and confronted, I don't know, Mongolians, Huns, Uyghurs. You could cross the Karakorom Desert and hit Lake Izikul in modern day Kyrgyzstan and go for a swim and to refresh yourself. For the last couple of thousand kilometers, you and your camels would wander down to Persia or the Red Sea to start your trading. Think about this, for nearly uh, 1500 years, this was the capital city of a kingdom. And think about the thousands of people that used to live here, work here, happiness here, sadness here. And I love to come into places like this and look at the old ruins and imagine what it would have been like way back then when people lived here. And how much we now just come through and kick the dust and wonder what it was like. Or just look at some old one mud walls and think. And imagine in a thousand years from now, if our societies collapsed and our cities collapsed, Imagine what the future tourists will be doing when they look at the ruins of Wall Street or Big Ben and wondering what those old cities were when they're covered in dust. Welcome to the Flaming Mountains outside Turpan in western China. It's called the Flaming Mountains because the summer heat here can be unbearable. They say the surface temperature can get up to 80 degrees Celsius. And imagine what that would have been like, just you and your camel full of goods walking through this area and the heat coming through the bottom of your sandals and the dust in your lungs. It's enough to make you want to climb down this cliff face to take a dip in the river. That's what life in the Silk Road in China would have been like. And as you entered China coming from the west towards east, you would have been reaching your goal in Xi'an in central China. And as you're coming uh, west out of China, you're just at the very beginning of your travels. Have you ever thought about this? All these people coming along the Silk Road converging for trade from different language groups and cultures. How do they communicate? Not everyone's at university back in those days learning different languages. Well, there are interesting ways of doing it and I was thinking about this last night because I was at the night market wanting to buy some dinner and I wanted some dumplings. And I looked at the dumplings at this dumpling seller and she looked back at me, she couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Uyghur or Chinese. So I looked at her and I said, these dumplings, are they chicken? And she said, nope, they're beef. We found a way of communicating. It's the agnostic power of trade. When people have an incentive, they'll find a way of coming together. Dotted throughout each of these cliffs are many caves nicknamed the Thousand Buddha Caves because there are thousands of Buddhas inside them, or more accurately, I should say, were. This part of the Silk Road was a heart of Buddhist belief and many of these caves were monasteries. When Islam came, many of the frescoes were defaced by chiseling out the face of the Buddha. But that wasn't the worst of it. 
the turn between the 18 and 1900s, a German archaeologist appropriately named Lecoq not only chiselled out the faces, but chiselled out the entire frescoes together with many of the statues of Buddha and took them back to Berlin, to the Berlin Museum for safekeeping, where they did stay safe for a little less than two decades until the Allies bombed the hell out of Berlin, including the museum, and turning all of these fine parts of human heritage to dust. I'm currently about 10 metres underground at Karaz, which is an underground water system built in the desert. Many of them started 2,000 years ago. This particular one was built about 1700. It was an underground irrigation system to bring water from the water table under the mountains down to the fields where they were growing agriculture. Now when you think about it, every 10, 20, 30 metres or so they dug a hole 10 metres underground or however deep they needed to go, some as deep as 80 metres mm -hmm. to reach the water table and then dug a flat channel to be able to transport the water. Now I think 2,000 years ago, how do you build a, a channel that could be many kilometres long which slopes slightly and you need to dr have a slope drop about one centimetres, sorry, about one centimetre every kilometre or so to get the right speed of water flow. More than that, the water goes too fast and is dangerous, and less than that, the water doesn't flow. So think, 2,000 years ago, you're 10 metres, 20 metres, 30 metres underground, and you're digging a channel which is 80 metres across and maybe, sorry, 80 centimetres across and maybe a metre high, and you're keeping the channel flat without any modern tools or technology. Incredible. As you can understand at the underground water system you would find a lot of Chinese trinkets and, and uh, souvenirs including the Chinese kangaroo. G'day mate. We're about three hours drive from Arumki in a town called Turpan which is the second lowest part in the world second only to the Dead Sea. A lot of this area is below sea level and it reaches from minus about 30 to plus about 50. So if you in Australia think we have a harsh climate, you should come here. I am outside the Imin Minaret built in 1777 while the Americans were busy kicking the British out of the United States. Imin was the local Islamic ruler here. He'd pledged his allegiance to the Qing Dynasty as part of China and he was a leader of the Uyghur people. The Uyghur people live in this western part of China, stretching from Arumki down to Kashgar, a name that echoes through the history of the Silk Road, and they're Islamic. But we can also see in this area a lot of Buddhist traditions around the old ancient Buddhist caves, giving another example of how religions had interrelated and coexisted all along the Silk Road. So we have a small mausoleum on the right and to the left next to it we have other burial chambers where you see the black soot of smoke that has been burnt from oil lamps which they say dates back to the shamanist religion way back from the early years before Christ. But you also still have around here like in Uzbekistan hints of the Zoroastrianism particularly at weddings. In Uzbekistan the married couple would walk three times around a fire believing it would bring them luck and they do something similar in Uyghur weddings here as well. But while we're talking about the Uyghurs let's talk about one aspect of culture that's very important which is language. The alphabet that is the Uyghur language uses is very similar to the Arabic alphabet and the Chinese government has insisted in the provincial government here that all signs need to be both in the Chinese script but in the Uyghur script and the Uyghur script must be above the Chinese script. So while many people in the West might see China as one great monolith, it really is a mix of different cultures, languages, religions and histories that have come together in the modern day China that we see today.